Christ. If you don't have a sermon outline, I would ask for, the, for you to raise your hand. These kind gentlemen will be glad to give you one. If you're clicking on this message on our website, you can click on the link below to download the actual notes. We study the Bible here, and this morning we come to one of the greatest chapters of the Bible, one of the greatest books of the Bible in the New Testament um, when it comes to the human heart uh, enjoying the encouragement of God's Word. This is one of the great places of encouragement in God's Word. And Pastor Ben is going to come and lead us in the Word this morning. Would you please welcome him to the pulpit and prepare your heart? Well, it's true. I drove Esther and the kids up to Minnesota this past week. And before we got to Minnesota, uh, we have been telling Noah for the past several months about how Esther and I met. So we stopped at Wheaton College where both Esther and I graduated. And this is right in front of the school, right in front of the sign with the two kids. And if um, you'll see Noah, a picture of Noah a little later. But we, we got to see essentially the fruit of our finances because they built so many new things since we've graduated with our tuition money. So... <laughs> It's just the way life is. Of course, we reap the benefits of people who've gone before us when we were at Wheaton. But I was just so blessed as we were driving up just remembering um, just the, the past several years at Sheridan Hills and thinking about, wow, what, what a sweet time of brotherly love, of genuine heartfelt Christian love for one another. Esther and I left... I was telling somebody this morning, we, we left with tears, we left with laughter, uh, we left with great joy in our hearts. And before we got to Minnesota, we had to stop by a Walmart to buy hats and weather gear, and this you'll see Sophia in this <laughs> big hat. The hat is bigger than her, so it wasn't fitting quite well. But I love how Noah looked. He had... He had one of those Nordic hats on that was bigger than his head, so it kept going over his face, which he liked because it was so cold. In fact, we had car troubles on the way up, and the Lord spared. Every time we turned on the car, we said, Lord Jesus, please spare us. Help us to go 100 more miles. And he did, 1,800 miles. So I prayed 18 times that the Lord would spare us. <laughs> and so we finally get to Minnesota, and just to give you an idea of how cold it was, I was trying to do some repair work on the car, and I was holding onto a wrench, and my thumb slipped into the closed end part of the wrench, and it fell off and hit the rotor of my wheel, and I didn't think it was a big deal. It was 15 degrees outside, and my fingers felt like the frozen turkey on Thanksgiving morning, just frozen. So I walked into the house about half an hour later, I started feeling a very throbbing sensation in my thumb. And I didn't know what it was. And I looked, and all of a sudden, I saw this, this massive bruise on my thumb. It's so cold in Minnesota that I couldn't even feel the pain initially. I had to wait half an hour. So to give you an idea of how cold it is uh, and how much snow fell, they canceled my flight yesterday in the morning. And I flew out, and there was already a foot of snow this morning to add to the three feet that had already fallen. So God has brought us to Minnesota. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to believe that God did this because we're starting to think a little bit about what this means for our family. So uh, the best part about our drive, like I said, was just reminiscing on the past and just thinking about Scripture and we do this, Esther and I do this occasionally, where we'll sit and think about what passages of Scripture come to mind when we think about our friends. And the passage that came to mind for, for me was Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 11. And we're going to look at that. But before we do, I want to just, just give you a glimpse, just give you a vision for what the book of Philippians is about. Paul wrote the letter to the Philippian church while he was in prison. Paul founded this church in AD 50, so just a couple, you know, two decades after Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven. 
In Acts chapter 16 is where we get the story of the, the church at Philippi. Paul receives a vision. Now, you can't make this up. You can't, this is going to sound incredible, but this is God's word, I'm telling you. Paul receives a vision from a Macedonian man saying, come to Macedonia, we need help. So Paul begins his journey to Macedonia, and he begins to think about what it's like to minister there. On the way, he stops in Philippi, but can't find a synagogue. So what does he do? He tries to find a gathering place of god fears, people who are praying and people who are thinking about God. And so he sees a bunch of women praying, and one of the first converts that he meets at Philippi that he shares the gospel with is Lydia, who's a businesswoman, and she and her household are saved. And then as he continues journeying on, a demon-possessed girl begins to infuriate Paul, and he heals her. That's what you get for infuriating Paul. You get healed. So he heals her, which sets off a riot in the city. So then Paul is thrown in jail for healing this demon-possessed girl, for causing this riot. And while in jail, while Paul and Silas are singing hymns, there's an earthquake all in one day. I'm serious. This all happened in one day, okay? God sets Paul and Silas free, but then... To make this even more incredible, and by that I just mean remarkable, you should believe this, God gives Paul an opportunity to share the gospel again, this time with the suicidal Philippian jailer who realized, oh no, all of my prisoners are gone, I'm toast. Paul shares the gospel with him, he becomes saved. All in a day's work for the Apostle Paul. It's amazing. What God did, and, and the book of Acts is often called the Acts of the Apostles, which I think is, is the wrong title because Jesus is the one who's acting in this book. It's the Acts of Jesus Christ that continue through the Apostles. And you see it clearly in this story of the Philippian church. The way this church is founded is not normal. It is supernatural. And just like any church that begins, it's planted it's watered, it grows, it's supernatural. And so this is what we're experiencing here with this church. Its beginnings were supernatural. I think about the beginnings of Sheridan Hills, and Sheridan Hills began as a supernatural act of God. In fact, many of you come from churches that began simply because a group of Christians got together, they became Christians, they got baptized, and they needed to meet because they needed to sing God's praise. They needed to practice the Lord's Supper. They needed to baptize other believers and teach and hear the word, sing the word, pray the word. So these churches are just starting supernaturally. So this letter was written in part because Paul is thanking the Philippian church for their continued support of his ministry. After he left Philippi, we get an indication that this church kept helping Paul financially and helping Paul materially. So in chapter 4, verse 18, we read Paul saying to the church, I have received full payment and more. I am supplied to having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. It is through these, these generous brothers and sisters at the church of Philippi that Paul continued his work. But Paul also wrote this letter to encourage this church. In Philippians chapter 12, verse 30, we see that Paul is purely, simply, about the encouragement of the faith of the Philippian church. Paul also wanted to encourage them about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was one of Paul's ministry partners who got ill and almost died, and the church was concerned about him and said, what can we do? What can, how can we pray for Epaphroditus? So Paul gives them an update in chapter 2, verse 25 to 30. But the main reason why Paul wrote this letter, the main reason is to show us Christ's joyful humility, and how we might, as Christians, model this joyful humility in our lives. That's the main reason why he wrote this letter. The theme of joy and, humili and humility is interspersed throughout this. It's everywhere. So, for instance, Paul is writing in a prison, which in itself is humble, right? This is a humble situation. Paul is not writing from an ivory tower. He's writing from chains in a dungeon, 
But he is filled with joy. Listen to what he says in Philippians 1, 12 to 14. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What a perspective to have, right? You're in prison. Paul, don't you know that you might get executed? And he's saying, great. I get another opportunity to share the gospel. I mean, these prison guards are all pagans. I'm going to share the gospel with them. And I might do what I did in Philippi. I'll sing songs until there's an earthquake, and then people get converted. I mean, have you ever sung songs till there was an earthquake and people got converted? So Paul can't contain the gospel. He needs to share it. But look at this. Paul is writing from prison, but he is content. That's one of the other lessons we learned from the book of Philippians. In chapter 4, verse 10, Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. There's that theme of joy. That now, at length, you have revived your concern for me. There's humility. People looking for the needs of others. The church looking for the needs of Paul. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I'm speaking of being in need, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul is also writing from prison as a person committed to Jesus Christ. Look what he says in Philippians 3, verse 7. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. I mean, you're not robots. Come on. We read that, and you're thinking, how can Paul say that? He's in prison, and how can he be committed to Jesus? I mean, if I were in prison, I would think, I need to call my lawyer. I need to get out of here. I need to go see my kids. I need to go see my wife. I need to go work. Who's going to pay the bills? And yet Paul here is saying, whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. I mean, it's probably easier for him to say that now that he's in prison. He has no more possessions. But are we going to say the same thing when we face trials? I count everything as loss for gaining Christ. So Paul is really showing us here the transformative power of the gospel. You get from saying, I need to call my lawyer, to, good, I'm in prison, and it's my opportunity to share the gospel. So Paul is also writing from prison to strengthen the faith of the Philippians, to strengthen the, the faith of the Philippians. Listen to this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. It is my eager expectation. Listen to this language, because this is such powerful language. If you're in your Bibles, it's Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you... Just stop there for a minute. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Isn't life today about living it to the fullest? Trying to postpone death as long as possible? And yet here Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now why is it gain for Paul to die? Why would he rather die? Because he tells us in the next verse, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor to me, yet which I shall choose, I I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart 
and be with Christ, for that is far better. It's an amazing statement. That is far better. It's far better to be with Christ than to be in this world. Now, look what he says in verse 24. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. You see the humility here? And Paul is saying, I'd rather be with Jesus, but that, that will come. But first, you need encouragement. Look what he tells him in verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. You see joy again, the theme of joy. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul is so committed to these people's joy, and he's willing to do anything so that he can accomplish joy in these people. So Paul is also then writing, finally, to remind the Philippians about Jesus. Listen to this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't say, which you can attain in Christ Jesus, or which through a series of trials and steps you will attain. He says, this mind is already yours in Christ. The mind of humility and the mind of joy is already yours. So as a Christian, what do you do? You, you take it. You seize it. You say, I am a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I was born again for joy, for humility. This is who I am. And look what, the, look what Paul then says. This is what Christ did. Verse 6, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you might want to circle all those absolute words. The name that is above every name, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, everything you can see, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, those are very intentional, absolute statements. And Paul doesn't just make absolute statements because he's being dramatic. He's making absolute statements because whether we like it or not, in the end, Jesus will be exalted. And if he is exalted, when he is exalted, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It doesn't matter who you are, believer or non-believer, you will either submit with joy, with humility, or you will submit with gnashing of teeth. This is a picture of God's ultimate judgment through the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Of course, here we like to think of this passage as a passage of Christ's exaltation. As Christians, we exalt Christ. We just did it this morning. He's our firm foundation. We exalt you, Christ. But friend, if you're here this morning, there's really not another option. You may think that going through life will yield some sort of benefit at the end, perhaps because you're good and God will say, well done. You did better than my son on the cross. I will let you into heaven. Or perhaps you think there's nothing after death. We just kind of, you know, fly away like mist, like ashes. It's not that easy either. Christianity is more complicated than that. Christianity doesn't teach that we'll be annihilated or that we'll somehow decompose into the ground. Christianity teaches that we will suffer an eternal torment apart from Christ. So much for decomposition and no life after death. There's only two lives after death, the one with Christ and the one without him. And so, brothers and sisters, we are the ones 
who exalt at the coming. And if you exalt at the coming of Jesus Christ, you live with him. And that's what Paul's showing us here. This joy, this humility that's so transformative turns a mouth that blasphemes into a mouth that praises. It turns a mouth that seeks idolatry to a mouth that seeks God's soul glory. This is amazing. And this is true for all of us who are Christians. So as we read the passage this morning, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. Keep in mind these things that we just talked about, that joy, contentment, commitment to Christ, persevering faith, and Christ's example of humility and exaltation should permeate your understanding of the text we're about to read. So let me read Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 11. Let me read this, and I want you to have a pen on hand because there's some things that you need to circle here and underline that we'll explore more. So listen to this. This is Philippians chapter 1. This is in your outline on the top of the page. It's also on the screen. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So if you have a pen, I just want to go back again, and I want to show you some things here. First of all, look at verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God in all, and you can circle the word all there, this is pretty important, in all my remembrance of you. And if you circle the word you, because that's a plural word. Paul's not just talking to you as an individual, he's talking to us as a church. So God's word is for us to, this morning as a church. In verse 4, Always, again, another absolute statement, another absolute word. Circle the word always. In every, another absolute. In every prayer of mine, for you all. Look, you see? It keeps happening. We're not even in two verses. All, circle the word all. Making my prayer. Now, underline with joy. I think Paul implies here that there is a way to pray that is not with joy. Right? Right? He's saying, pray, making my prayer with joy. But now look at verse 5. Why is he praying with joy? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now look here. Under first day, you can write past. This was back in the old days when Paul came and established this church. They became partners with him from that day. And now... Some people, some scholars say this has happened 12 years, 15 years after. Until now, look how faithful this church has been. Look how many years this church has been faithful to the gospel. So look at that. First day, from the first day, that's past until now. That's present. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Look at the next verse. I am sure of this, that he who began the past, he who began the work, Good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, that's the future. Now, what is he telling this congregation? From the past to the present to the future, God will keep you faithful. It's amazing. And look, look at how he structures this. He says, first, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and look at this, and I am sure of this. Look at what he adds there. I am sure of this. Now, Paul is sure about future salvation for Philippian, the Philippian church. Why? Because, listen to this, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. The basis of our future justification, future salvation, our hope that we will stand before Jesus pure and blameless is 
God working in us from here on out. Look how he structures this. It's beautiful. When you see that in the past, in the present, and from here on out to the future, till the day of Christ where he is exalted and every tongue confesses and every knee bows, God will finish the work. Now, Paul does say later on that you ought to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. So we're not saying that we're not responsible for praying and for reading God's word and for coming to church and for loving other people more than you love yourself. But Paul is saying here, God is behind that. And that's why I thank God. It's amazing. He hasn't left you. I think about Sheridan Hills. Sheridan Hills has been around for almost 50, almost 60 years. Past, present, future. How will Sheridan Hills, how will we guarantee that Sheridan Hills will be around in 60 years? Because God is the one who started the good work and he'll bring it to completion. That's our hope this morning, friends. So then look at the next couple of verses here. Paul says, it is right for me to feel or think this way about you all. Now, what is he referring to? He's referring to this past, present, future established uh, salvation by God. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel. So look at that circle. It is right for me to feel this way. It is right. And then you'll see there that Paul says something very striking. I hold you, I have you in my heart. What a tender thing to say to a congregation. I am confident that God will save you because I have you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace. Again, Paul is saying, you have partnered with me in God's grace, in his salvation. And then look what he says, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And then look at this beautiful statement in verse 8, for God is my witness. And you can circle that whole phrase because Paul is not just saying, I have really, hard, like really strong feelings about you. I just like all of you. You're all very likable. And it's easy for me to love you. And I'm praying for you. Just trust me. It's my word. He doesn't say that. He says, God knows I pray for you. God knows I love you. So look at this. God is my witness how I yearn. Underline that word, yearn. For you all, again, all, you can circle that word, with the affection of Christ Jesus. We're going to get to what that means, but you see his heart here? He is yearning for these brothers and sisters with the affection of Christ. This is very strong language, but it's biblical language, and it's language that we should use to one, for one another. Now, he keeps going, and he says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, it's very interesting that he prays for their love. Wouldn't you think he'd pray for something else? I mean, he's in prison. Say, I'm going to pray for your encouragement. I'm going to pray for your encouragement. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be so happy when you came to church you can't even stand it. Or I'm going to pray for your holiness. What you really need here is holiness. Because you can get discouraged and you got to fight sin and all that. Now, he doesn't say any of that. In fact, he starts with love. He says, it is my prayer that your love may increasingly increase all the more. Why love? Isn't it true that when we're facing a trial when we're anxious, when we're discouraged, at those moments we don't feel loved by God? Look at Ephesians 3, for example. Paul dedicates half of the chapter to 
praying for the love, that you would know the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of God's love. Why? Because fighting sin is going to be about how much you think God loves you in Christ Jesus. Perfect love casts out fear. It casts out sin. It covers a multitude of sins. What you need is an acknowledgement that God loves you and he is for you in every single way. And that's what fuels, what Paul says in verse 10, that's what fuels discernment, choosing between good and evil. In verse 10, that you may approve what is excellent. And that is then what fuels holiness. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And that in turn is what fills you with the fruit of righteousness that says, I'm going to look to needs of others instead of my own needs. Because you're filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. You see how love is what fuels all of that? Your knowledge of God's love is vastly important for the success of this church. And I think Sheridan Hills has, in many ways, felt the love of God. Has expressed the love of God to one another. So I'm encouraged by this passage, not because this to me is abstract, that this is somehow removed from reality for me. This is the reality that I experienced at Sheridan Hills for the last five years. Love that feels discernment, that feels holiness, that feels good works through Christ and for God's glory. And so, brothers and sisters, I, I hope this is what fuels your desire to glorify God. So let's look at the text. The main point, very quickly, is the main point of this text. What I want you to see here from 3 to 11 is that Paul joyfully thanks God. Paul joyfully thanks God for his partnership with the Philippian church and prays for their love to continue to grow. He prays for the love to continue to grow. Now, the title of the message that I put, and I did this last minute, Building Lasting friendships or building friendships that last is because we want to ask the question, what will cause long-term, joyful, loving partnerships in the gospel at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church? What will cause that from here on out? What has caused it up until now and what will cause it from here on out? How will we build lasting friendships, partnerships in the gospel? It's an important question because mainly the, the three temptations I want you to fight is, we'll call the first one Lone Ranger Christianity, that says, I don't need friends, I don't need partners in the gospel in order to make it from past, present, future salvation. I just need Jesus. Give me Jesus in the closet war room and I'm done. That's me and him. I don't need God's people. The only problem with that is you're essentially telling Jesus, I don't like your wife. I don't like your bride. She smells funny. She's mean to me. She didn't say hi to me this past Sunday. I'm done with it. That's it. Or she confronted me. She told me the truth and love, and I'm done. I just want you, Jesus. Now, what do you think Jesus is going to say to that? You don't love my wife? Are you really my friend? So Lone Ranger Christianity is just out of, the, out of the picture. You see why. It doesn't make any sense. But the other type of error and, con and thing that we should fight is the self-sufficient Christian, the one who says, I will only make friends with other Christians to teach them what they should do. I don't need to learn anything. I've already got it figured out, which is another temptation, right? we got to figure it out. I don't need to listen to anybody. I come to church every Sunday. I bring my Bible. I know. I, look, I even look up Strong's Concordance when I study the Bible. How many other Christians do that? I know the Greek word in this text, and I'm ready to explain it to anybody who asks. That is a temptation we must avoid, brothers and sisters, because that will choke and kill the church. Pride and arrogance will lead to our downfall. The final temptation I think we need to avoid is the temptation toward indifference. Saying, 
I don't need any of this. I don't need Christ, and I don't need the church. I'm just going to try it on my own. And this is perhaps the most dangerous one because we don't all of a sudden wake up and tomorrow you feel this way. This is a gradual shift toward error, toward temptation. And so, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of warning in this passage for us, but there's a lot of encouragement. So let's turn there now. What will help us fight those temptations and what will help us build lasting relationships? The first thing that I want us to see is Paul's joyful thanks for the Philippians. Paul's joyful thanks for the Philippians. Paul, listen to this. I had you circle a bunch of words. Paul thanks God often, often for the Philippians. He does it often. He prays for them. He thanks God for them. Think about this. In the letter to the Romans, at the end of the book, he lists a bunch of names. Perhaps in your Bible, maybe today after church, write a list of 10 people that you are going to thank God for in your life. At the back of my Bible, I have a list of 10 people on one note. I, I downloaded the app, one note. Make a list. 10 people that I'm praying for and thanking God for. These people, if they weren't in my life, I don't know where I'd be as a Christian. Thank God for the people around you often. But also, Paul also thanks God for a united body of believers. And so li listen to this. We looked at the beginning where Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you all, because it's plural, always in every prayer of mine for all you all. That's what he's saying. You all, all. You know, all y'all. What is he praying for here? What is he thanking God? He is thanking God for a united body. All you all. There is no distinction here. All of you are the body of Christ. What a, what a profound thing for Paul to say. Especially because he's writing this church not He's writing to a church that's not divided. There is no theological problem in this church. Listen to this. In the first couple verses of this chapter, Paul says, Paul and Silvanus to the overseers and deacons. This is the only letter that Paul writes that's addressed to leadership of the church. The other churches he's writing to, think of a, you know, Corinth and Galatia, those leaders are messed up. But this church, he includes the leaders. Why? Because they're doing great. They're helping this church become healthy. They're helping this church grow. I think about Sheridan Hills. I think about how God has, in many ways, placed healthy leaders in this church. Amen. Pastor Andrew, Pastor Lucas, Pastor Fred, our deacon team, God has brought healthy people in this church. Thankfully, as I leave this church and in the future, because God has placed healthy leaders in this church, we can hope and we can trust that the Lord will sustain this church. Not because there's something inherently powerful about spiritual leaders in the church, but it's because God is the shepherd of this church. And as far as we stick to the Bible... I mean, as soon as we start opening up 90s classic hits from the pulpit, you ought to run from Sheridan Hills. But God's word is preached here because that's what's worth it, and that's what we see at the Church of Philippi. This church is united because its leaders have led it to be united. Praise God for a united church like Sheridan Hills. As I look back, I, I just think, in five years since I've been here, the Lord has sustained Sheridan Hills in unity. In the last 60 years, God has sustained Sheridan Hills in unity. Not many churches can say that. And we need to quickly go to the Lord and say, we're next if we don't hold fast. So Paul is writing to a united body of believers. But Paul also thanks God in a certain way. He thanks him through joyful prayer. Now, how do we define joy? Because joy isn't glib happiness that is here today and gone tomorrow. 
Uh, just think about Noah, gave him 25 cents, put it in the little gumball machine. He was so happy. And then I said, you can't have that, buddy. I'm sorry. It'll rot your teeth and you'll probably choke on it. And immediately, he was sad. And not talking about that kind of happiness. We're talking about a different, deeper kind of joy. Some scholars say that this type of joy that Paul is referring to is an overarching mindset that allows Paul to look beyond his personal situation in prison to the sovereign God who stands above all events, who put him there, and ultimately has control over whether he'll come out or not. I, I just think that from reading this book, you can come away thinking rightly about what joy is. Joy is the experience of lasting gladness that comes by looking to Jesus. It is lasting gladness, and Paul says several times, rejoice in the Lord. I say again, rejoice always in the Lord, because that is the mark of true joy. It's connected to Jesus Christ. So Paul thanks God through joy. Now, do you have this kind of joy? Do you have the joy to pray for people in your life through Christ? Think about ways that you can bless others just by thanking God for them. God has put people in your life, and we can give thanks with joy. But Paul also thanks God because of a continued partnership in the gospel. And you see that in verse 3 and 4. Notice that this partnership is in the gospel. There is a difference between natural affinities, things that we like to do together, like fishing and repairing cars. Although, to be honest with you, repairing a car by yourself is not enjoyable to me at all. I love working with other men in this church fixing cars because we could talk about life. They have more strength than I do so they can loosen the bolts faster. But notice how this particular partnership is in the gospel. We can, we can come around coffee together, but a coffee bean is squat compared to the worth of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come together and we rejoice in Jesus Christ. That's what we did this morning. I mean, there's no coffee altar here. We came here because we all in common believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we praise together. But notice also the length of time of their partnership. We talked about the past, the present, and the future, and Paul goes on in the rest of the letter to show great confidence in Christ's work in the Philippian church. And this morning, I have great confidence that Sheridan Hills, if it sticks to God's word, will continue in this way, in this path. Our partnership is in the gospel, and so, as long as it's in the gospel, we will be a success. Finally, Paul thanks God with certainty. N notice that Paul is certain in verse 6. Why is he certain? Because of God. God is the one who began the work. He's the one who brings it to completion. Salvation from A to Z is Christ's work on our behalf. It is Christ's substitutionary death in our place, takes our sin, clothes us in righteousness, rises from the dead, and is exalted. And that salvation is God's salvation through Christ for you. It's available to all. It is available to all who put their trust in him. So notice that this completion, this salvation happens at the day of Christ, when Jesus Christ comes back exalted, instantly we will be made perfect and like Christ. But Paul doesn't just stop there. He goes on, not just to give joyful thanks to the Philippians, but for the Philippians, but he gives a Christ-like affection. He shows Christ-like affection for the Philippians. How do you want to do you want to build lasting friendships at Sheridan Hills in the gospel? Show Christ-like affection for each other. And look at what this says. Paul says, it is right for me to feel, to think this way about you. Christ-like affection is right. It is good. To feel, think, observe, to judge, what Paul is saying is behind his Christ-like affection is crucial in Philippians. 
the act of feeling and thinking affection for others. This type of thinking that Paul is promoting promotes unity in the church in Philippians 2 verse 2. It promotes maturity. Philippians chapter 3 verse 15, you can write that to the side. Let those of us who are mature think this way, Paul says. And he's talking about Christ being the surpassing worth. So you might not be a Christian who thinks that Christ is really the surpassing worth. You might be a Christian, but you might just not be a mature Christian. And Paul is saying here, those of us who are mature, let us think this way, that Christ is surpassing above all. That no mortgage, no car, no college experience is ever going to trump Christ Jesus. And this promotes service to others. This type of thinking promotes service to others. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. The, the Philippians are concerned about Paul. They show a concern. They show a thought, a feeling, an affection of joy for Paul's need. And I wonder, as you're hearing needs at Sheridan Hills over the next few years, will you have the mind of Christ to pursue service to others? I think about so many people in our church who have this mind. They're wired this way through Christ, and they jump at the opportunity to serve. When Esther and I were in the hospital with Sophia, this sweet woman in our church came and she said, I've got $300 worth of gift cards for you guys. I don't want you to starve. And I just thought, what an extraordinary expression of God's love and faithfulness to us through the body. So this promotes service to others. But it finally comes from having the mind of Christ. You have to think like Christ in order to have this mind, this mind of affection. So this Christ-like affection is right, but it is also deep. This Christ-like affection is deep. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And the word that Paul uses for the word affection is that inner sense of feeling that you get from your heart, your kidneys, your stomach, that inward passion that then cannot be contained. It comes out. Paul is screaming from the pages here, I love you so much, I'm willing to do anything for you. What kind of affection should we have for each other as Christians? The love that Christ has for us that works itself out in our love for each other. The type of affection we should have is the type of affection that Christ has for us. We're on the cross, he is giving his life, and he's saying, go and do likewise for each other. This is deep. This is not just a surface level Christianity. Cultural Christianity does not penetrate to this type of feeling, of emotion, of love for one another. I pray for Sheridan Hills to have this. I pray for it to continue in it. Because many of you love this way. Many of you love this way. But God can help us be deep in our affection for one another. And finally, Paul has a hopeful prayer for genuine love among the Philippians. He prays for genuine love. Look at, look at what he says about genuine love. You're wondering, okay, I, I want Christ-like affection, or I, I think I have Christ-like affection. Well, Paul gives you a couple of tests. What does Christ's affection, what does his love do in us? Well, look at the first thing he says. It is increasing, that it may abound more and more, Paul writes. Genuine love increases. He literally writes that your love may increase increasingly more. He's using superlatives here to say true, genuine Christian love grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. It never stops. How do you know when you should forgive your brother? Have you forgiven him 470 times? No? Start. Go. How do you know when enough service has been served? Do you want to keep serving? Serving, serving, serving? We know 
that our love is genuine when our love increases for others, when our service increases in one another, when forgiveness becomes the first thing we, we seek in conflict, when peace becomes the anthem of our heart and not conflict. But look what else love does. It discerns. It can discern, love can discern because it is rooted in knowledge of God. And that's where it all starts. You see what Paul says here. He says, I pray that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. This knowledge comes through Jesus Christ. When Christ reveals to us the glory of God, that he is holy, 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 that God is love, that God is steadfast, that he will show his love and kindness to infinite amount of generations. But God is so holy that he will judge iniquity. He will judge sin. When we come to know God, this God, the God of the Bible, and not the cookie-cutter God of culture, we begin to realize there is such a thing as good and bad. There is a way that we can distinguish between good and evil. By the way, this is why we will never solve social injustice in our culture, in our society, with legislation. Laws do not change the heart to love in a discerning way. Christ can only do that. So as we're looking in our culture and as we're seeing legislation passed, we need to remember that legislation as Christians doesn't work. It doesn't give you a new heart. What culture needs, what the society at large needs, is a heavy dose of knowledge of God and love shown through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. And that's why you are a Christian in your workplace, in your school setting, with your friends. Because you are going to show them that dose of knowledge and love. If your love is increasing and abounding more, you're like the Apostle Paul. You're in prison, and the imperial guards are being converted because you're there. This is not a special type of Christian. This just takes genuine Christians. And insofar as Sheridan Hills is a light in Hollywood, may you do this in the power of God. May you go out and love and show the knowledge of God so that people will be transformed. Genuine love also yields good works. Genuine love, Paul says, results in a purity and a blamelessness for the day of Christ. There's a preparation that love, that takes place when love is, is within our hearts and abounding. Paul says that we become filled with the fruit of righteousness, and that's referring to the results, the, the genuine work that Christians do. There's several things we can point to here to see if we have genuine love as Christians. If we're truly Christians, it, our love is increasing. Our love is distinguishing between good and evil. Our love is yielding good works. But finally, the distinguishing factor about genuine love that is so important in the life of the Christian is that it results in the praise of God. Genuine love praises God. Ultimately, love and the working out of good works is for the praise of God. As I've thought about Sheridan Hills, I've thought about the many times this church has helped me to see the love of God working itself out in discernment, in the knowledge of God. This church has helped me to see what it means to be a Christian who works out their salvation with fear and trembling. I think about all the times that I spent with Pastor Andrew and remembering and thinking about the gospel and hearing the repeated, it took a while, the repeated reminders of let's stick to the gospel, let's be faithful. This is what we need to do. This is what the church needs several hundred times in our pastor's meetings on Tuesdays and Friday mornings, we'd pray these prayers for our church. 
And not only Pastor Andrew, the deacons in our church, some of you sisters who lead have constantly reminded me of what it takes to build lasting relationships that are gospel-centered. It takes joyful thanksgiving. It takes Christ-like affection. And it takes love that abounds more and more for God's glory. So let's pray.